Okay, thanks guys. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm going to start by doing a quick experiment. Now, everybody hates crowd participation, but can I ask you all to just stand up, please? Oh, take two seconds. Oh, all the groans. Okay. Come on, stand up. Okay. Come on, it's not that bad. You can, you can go back to your phones and laptops afterwards. We've got a microphone set up, but for this experiment to work, we need to make a lot of noise. So can you just all start clapping or like making noise? But it needs to be really loud. So it needs to be higher. A, a bit higher. As loud as you can. Right, keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Okay. <laughs> Upload to Instagram. <laughs> Just finished at awards, even got a standing ovation. Thanks, guys. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Okay. Graham McDonald, The New York Times. This is my dad. Okay, my dad is 82 years old. He's actually fitter than me. He can run faster than me, believe it or not. But I guess like most of us in this room, he doesn't have a clue what I do for a living. Okay, so I like, I say, oh, you know, I, he knows I work for The New York Times. So he's like, so you're a journalist? And I'm like, no, like I, I, I work, technically it's advertising, but we do tell stories. It's just more on the, the creative side. So he's like, oh, okay, so you, you design the newspaper. I'm like, mm, no. I mean, we still do quite a lot of print, and it's still a big part of our business, but it's more digital, it's more interactive, it's more technical. And he's like, so you build the website? And I'm like, no, no, you're not really getting it. And I thought, fair enough. Like, my role is kind of like broad. It isn't exactly black and white. You can't really sum it up in one image. But I thought, if I were to sum it up in one image, it'd probably look something like this. Now, I would love to be a sort of international spy, but what I'm really talking about is this, okay? <laughs> Product placement, okay? So I don't know how familiar you are with branded content, but branded content is essentially content that sits within uh, the platform of a publisher that looks like, sounds like, and should like feel like the native uh, content that it sits around. So it's essentially product placement in journalism, okay? So the same way that Aston Martin reap the benefits when uh, their cars are in a, in a James Bond movie, a brand can feel the same sort of effects when they're aligned with someone like the New York Times or any other publisher out there. Um, the problem is there's a really, really common trap that you can fall in when you're doing something like this, and it usually goes some, something like this. Let me get you some help, Truman. There we go. You're not well. Why do you want to have a baby with me? You can't stand me. That's not true. <laughs> Why don't you let me fix you some of this new Mococo drink? All natural cocoa beans from the upper slopes of Mount Nicaragua, no artificial sweeteners. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Who are you talking to? I've tasted other cocos. This is the best. What the hell? Does this have to do with anything? Tell me what's happening! Now, I'm sure a few of us have had a, a, a sort of ad experience like that, and it's something that we, you know, we try and avoid. It's really trendy at the moment to sort of talk about being a disruptor, but people forget just how frustrating it is to be disrupted. And there's this really interesting quote. It says, we need to stop interrupting what people are interested in and be what people are interested in. Because people's sort of capacity for bullshit is, is just dimish, diminishing. You know, we're constantly trying to maximize the signal and minimize the noise. And our willingness to sort of be inconvenienced or interrupted is, is dwindling. Um, this is a really, really good ad that, uh, that sums it up for me. And in a perfect world, branded content <laughs> It's content that, like I said earlier, it looks like, sounds like, and it even feels like what uh, the, the native content that it sits around. The only difference is it's paid for by a brand to sort of 
uh, promote a product or a service in some way. Obviously, this is a really simplified uh, view of it, but in a nutshell, it's essentially what we do at the studio. Now, a lot of clients come to us saying, you know, like, we want VR or like, we want a podcast, we want augmented reality. We go back to them with the same answer every single time because it's really, really important to figure out the story first and then how to tell it afterwards. Because even in the word itself, story comes before the telling. So it's really, really important before you start thinking about the execution, like what is the message we're trying to say? Everybody loves a good story, okay? It's, it's built into our DNA. Um, I've got another talk that I do, um, and some of the other speakers earlier touched upon it about this idea of generalist versus specialist. Like I said earlier, my career started out with music, I moved into film, eventually moved into design. Um, I'm not the best at any of those kinds of things, and, and you know, the guys earlier, the experts, will, will talk a lot about that. But what um, I find that is common throughout all of those things is storytelling. You know, you could go way back to sort of cave paintings, hieroglyphics, uh, everything. It's, it's a vital tool for communication. Research has actually shown that the chemical makeup of your brain actually changes when you're listening to the sto a story, and it can cause you to align your views and opinions with the person that's telling the story. So, let's watch a quick story. Hopefully there's audio. <laughs>
me every time that video. <laughs> so I can't take the credit for that. That wasn't a New York Times film, but I chose it for a number of reasons, and that is one of them. Like, it wasn't done by us. I didn't want this talk to be too much of a branded content experience for you guys. Uh, number two is you'll notice it didn't have any words at all. So it's actually like a, an ad for a Spanish lottery. It was ran a couple of years ago. And I think, you know, we'll all agree, it did a pretty good job at telling a good story. What this, uh, what this uh, story did re really well is it creates a journey and it made it relevant. Uh, it didn't focus on how many millions you'd win if you won the lottery, involved the character, realizing he had a family, and it was relatable. Now, when you take any story, okay, it usually follows a very similar pattern. Um, and it's a really, really simple equation when you think about it. Um, first thing you do is you introduce an element, okay? So this is probably someone the audience should like. At the very least, it's somebody they should be emotionally invested in. You, you sort of care what happens to this person, and this is the hook that you use to get people in. The second thing you do is you present a problem. Um, this is some sort of hurdle of some kind. It could be a challenge. It could be a bad guy. In our case, it was the loneliness of our security guard. Um, and this is why a lot of corporate stories, a lot of branded stories fail, is because they lack the one element that makes a good story, which is conflict. And then the third thing is you reveal the outcome. So this is the pot of gold at the end, some kind of reward, some kind of physical or emotional sort of uh, payoff, and this sort of, um, the attention and the payoff leads us to sharing the emotion with the characters of the story. And like I say, next time you read a book, you watch a movie, you tell a joke, nine times out of 10, it will follow these three steps. So I know we've got quite a young crowd in, but just a quick show of hands, who, how many people have got kids? Okay, now keep your hands raised if you have trouble getting kids to eat vegetables. Yes, yeah, so most people. Okay, there's a really, really simple trick to getting kids to eat something that they don't like, and that's to hide it in something they do like, right? So this is a, a slight twist on a really, really good presentation by a guy called uh, Doug Stevenson, and he introduces this metaphor. Basically, the uh, brand is the thing that you want the audience to digest, okay? So this is the message. Now, they don't want to. They don't like the taste of it. They'd rather be um, consuming something they do like. So what you do is you hide it in something they do like to digest. And this is usually the story, okay? Sounds kind of deceitful, but it's not really because the, the, the audience is still getting what they want and the brand is still injecting this brand messaging in. Um, it's much more digestible if it's in something they like. Uh, and a good example of this is a, a story we told for uh, Volvo a couple of years ago. So Volvo got this vision that they don't want any deaths or serious injury in Volvo cars, and they asked us to help. So we sent a team to Gothenburg to try and figure out how. Um, we discovered this amazing story where if a, a Volvo car crashes within 50 miles of the, the uh, Gothenburg headquarters, they've got this amazing crash response team that go out and get to analyze the crash, uh, figure out what happened, how they can make things safer. And this is the story you should tell. It's, it's much, much more human and relatable. When we look back to the equation from earlier, um, all we've really done is switch the two, first two points around. So the first thing is you pre present the problem. This is cars need to be safer. Um, and again, it's something that the audience need to care about. Of course, I don't want to be injured when I'm driving. Then you introduce the element. This is usually the brand. This is the thing that helps the brand, uh, helps the audience achieve or get past that hurdle. And again, the, the outcome is no more deaths or serious injuries within uh, Volvo cars. Um, this is much, much better than uh, an ad that, you know, we could have run an ad that just said, oh, they've got these new seat belts, they've got these new brakes, but this is much more human, much more easier to digest. And again, if we go back to our smoothie analogy, the thing that the brand wants to give to the audience is Volvo is a really safe car, but it's hidden within this story, a really cool story about a crash response team. Um, and it paints the, the client in a really good light. Um, this was a really good quote. Uh, Content marketing is like a first date. If you only talk about yourself, there won't be another one. So like I say, with the Volvo example, we could have easily just gone, Volvo's really safe, look at all these great things. Um, but telling this, human story is much more effective instead. 
It's really, really tempting as a brand to position yourself as the hero of the story, but this is actually a big, big mistake. Um, the audience should be the ones that see themselves as the hero of the story. Um, the protagonist should never be the brand. The protagonist of this, the brand should uh, be the reason that the protagonist succeeds, okay? So basically, as an audience member, I want, or digesting any story, I want to see myself as the hero, but as an intended byproduct, we come to see the brand as the reason why I can achieve my goals and get to the end. So let's assume we have our story, okay? How you tell a story is just as important as the story itself. Um, An execution is just as good, but it can never be a substitute. So sometimes it's easy to think, we've kind of got a story, we don't really know if it's right, it needs some work, but don't worry, because we're going to do it in VR and it's going to be great, everyone's going to love it. Um, that doesn't work, okay? So you really have to take your time. And obviously, there are millions of ways to tell stories. And I can't stand up here and say, this way's right, this way's wrong. There isn't a silver bullet, really. But what I will say is, take your time to figure out the best vehicle for the story you want to tell. Again, I keep picking on VR, but um, VR's a really hot topic. And the reality is that the majority of VR films would probably work better just as standard videos. Um, but that being said, execution and how you bring a story to life can be a really, really powerful story, uh, sorry, powerful tool to enhance a story if it's used in the right way. We recently launched a, a really big program for Shell uh, last year, and this was around their commitment to achieving net zero uh, emissions by 2070. So this is just a little snapshot of what we did for those guys. So yeah, you can see in that example, there's a lot of different executions. Um, the main thing about that is not one of those formats was chosen to tell that story because of a novelty value. So each, we, used, we had augmented reality, we had 3D uh, you know, films and stuff. Each format enhanced the story. It wasn't just the experience in itself. Um, the problem is a lot of those formats require a lot of investment if you want people to use them. And the, the reality is people are really, really good at gauging whether this investment is worth the payoff. So a while back, we used to do lots of lots of like really interactive digital stories on the New York Times. What we found is it's really hard to get the user to do anything when it comes to storytelling other than scroll. And if you make them click or filter or you know, interact, something spectacular has to happen. Because getting attention is not that difficult, but sustaining it is, okay? There's another really good quote that said something along the lines of, there's no such thing as an attention span because it's only the quality of what you're consuming. So, you know, if you've given them reason to stick about, there isn't, the attention span doesn't exist. Um, when information is cheap, attention becomes expensive. So that really sums it up. And this whole sort of university course is dedicated to the theory around retaining engagement. Um, we've got huge data teams at the New York Times that sort of look at the smallest elements to see what improves engagement. And, and we've got audience development teams to see how things are changing and everything else. Um, again, the guys earlier on, and you guys are all designers and you're all into this, so it's, I won't go into too many details, but there's a few really, really simple things that can help you along the way. Uh, the first one is the most obvious thing, okay? Make it visual. Going back to that investment uh, payoff scale, we see content as a smaller co cognitive lift. It, it's easier to digest. Um, trying really hard not to say the word snackable right now because everyone seems to be saying that. Um, but when you look at the stats, it's, it's really uh, convincing, you know? 
Visuals are processed 60,000 times quicker than words. Uh, it takes a tenth of the second to digest a, vis digest a visual compared to 200 words. Um, page pages with visuals draw 94% more views and 65% of visual information is retained. Um, sometimes whole sections of text can be replaced with just one image. Uh, the newsroom ran a really good thing uh, a couple of months ago when Apple hit the one trillion dollar valuation. How much is a trillion dollars? It's, it's really, really difficult to understand. Um, what they did, and I think this video should work, is basically just trying to put into perspective how much a trillion dollars is. They compared it to other companies, and it was a much, much more powerful uh, medium to tell this story if they used visuals. Second thing is to make it move. Again, sounds simple, but it, movement attracts attention. As human beings, we're genetically engineered to sort of highlight differences in our visual field. Again, this came, comes from like, you know, a genetic thing, primal thing, like scanning the horizon for dangers or anything else. Again, the newsroom ran a really, really good example um, when Notre Dame set on fire. Um, this was launched the day after, so they put it, this together really, really well. But this could easily have been executed as just a sort of infographic or uh, you know, static. What they did here, the movement and the interaction worked really well to communicate the message. Um, the third thing is make it interactive. Now, this is a tough one because getting a reward and sort of leveling up and getting feedback or achieving something gives you that dopamine rush, right? But as we saw before, Getting users and, and audience to interact with something is really, really difficult. And it usually comes down to three things. Number one, motivation. Do they, uh, what do they think they can get out of this? Is this worth my time to get to the end? The second one is ability. Is it within their capability to, to complete this task? And the third one is triggers. So are there any cues? Are there any signals or reminders to sort of encourage them to take that action? And the sense of achievement they get when they complete this is a little hit of dopamine for achieving a goal. This is a really clever example. Trying to get, stop people peeing on the floor, right? Because they, they, they gamified the peeing experience, <laughs> right? And it works wonders. It's, again, going back to the, uh, the three steps, it's, um, the payoff is good. You get to score a goal. The, the triggers are really easy. And uh, you know, it's, e it's easy to understand what you have to do. This is a little example of what we did for a program for Philips a while back. Um, again, on the right, what you have to do is sort of clean the tooth, but it was, uh, the motivation is they get this fact, um, but also it's quite fun to interact on the page. The ability, obviously, it's really, really easy to do this, and the trigger is the cur just the cursor change alone into a toothbrush, you instinctively know what to do. And that leads us into our fourth thing, which is make it obvious. Now, there's lots of UX designers in the room, I imagine. Everyone's heard the phrase, UX design is like a good joke, because if you have to explain it, it's not very good. Um, you need to make it instinctive um, about, so that users know exactly what to do. Um, the way I like to put it is to create a labyrinth and not a maze. So when you think of a maze, you've got all of these different options of where to go, there's loads of dead ends, there's loads of sort of different cognitive kind of challenges where you have to go through. Um, a labyrinth might be just as long as the maze, but there's one clear path that you, guides you through to the very end. You don't even have to think about it. You just go from start to finish, and it's instinctive. A really good example of this was a piece that we launched for Allbirds recently. Um, it follows all of the rules. It's very, very visual, and I think we have a uh, a video, yeah, it moves, it's slightly interactive, but doesn't require too much input. Um, and essentially all it is is text and nice visuals, but what it does is it tells a story and it, um, it ends up being much, much more engaging. So I'm not saying that, again, I'm hating on VR a little bit here, but I'm not saying VR is bad or never do animation. What I'm trying to say is the magic combination of a good story executed in the right way is the experience that we should all be aiming for. So do what's right for the story and do it well. So just a key little quick recap on, on what we've covered. Hide the vegetables, okay? So nobody wants to hear your CEO talking about how amazing the product is. You need to hide that in something that the audience likes to digest. Uh, take them on a journey, so follow the narrative arc. Take those three steps. 
We like to say at the New York Times that we want to create experiences that people lose their lunch hour to. You know, how many times have you been on, online or whatever, and all of a sudden you're like, wow, where have the last 10 minutes gone, you know? And then keep them engaged. So like I said earlier, getting attention is not difficult, but sustaining it is. Um, so just to sum it up, you hear time and time again that content is king. And this is true, but if it is true, then execution is the castle. Because you could have the best content in the world, but it won't be very effective if you don't find the best way to bring it to life. Um, thanks for having me, guys.